This is SOGCAST number 12. My name is John Stryker Meyer, and I'm here today as your host for SOGCAST number 12. And with this, this production is coming to you courtesy of Jocko Willink Productions and his right hand man, Echo Charles. And of course, today we're also joined by our secret, secret uh, technician here, Tom. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. And so with that, I'm going to turn to <clears throat> Across the Fence, which talks a little bit about our secret war. And this was in May 1968. A team had been extracted from an LZ, a landing zone. But it wasn't clear if the entire team was out or not. And so on that occasion, the King Bee, the South Vietnamese helicopter, was ordered to return to the LZ and on it, we had one staff sergeant, Robert J. Parks, who was on that helicopter going into the LZ. And because no one had radio covey to indicate the team was clear from the target, Spider directed the chase ship to land on the LZ to ensure that ST Oregon was extracted successfully. It was also a last act of desperation. He had hoped against all odds to see Lane, Robert Duval Owen, or one of the Vietnamese team members of ST Idaho. No one saw. Spider jumped aboard the H-34 as a mortar round exploded in the bomb crater and dozens of weapons fired upon the King Bee. As the chopper was lifting off, the door gunner sitting next to Spider Parks was killed. And this was one mission on one day, May of 68. And today it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Robert J. Spider Parks to SOGCAST number 12. Spider, welcome to the SOGCAST. Thank you, Teal. And um, on the, we started in the middle of one of those exceptional days where um, we didn't talk about ST Idaho, but at that time we had recon teams. Previously, you had been on a member of Spike Team Idaho. You had run several missions with the, uh, that team. Glenn Lane was the one zero. That's right. And at that point, <laughs> you had been promoted to your own team. You earned a new promotion. So you get transferred from Idaho. Lane goes out with a new team member, Robert Duval Owen, and that team we goes missing in action May 22nd, 1968, and they remain missing in action today. They are amongst the 50 Green Berets from the Secret War in Laos, Cambodia, and amongst the 1,583 Americans who are still missing in action today in Southeast Asia from the Secret War. So getting back to that day, the... Um, a standard operating procedure, if a team disappears or is in severe trouble, there's a bright light. And a bright light is an emergency insertion by a recon team. In this case, it was Spike Team Oregon with George uh, Sternberg, who, if you haven't seen it, was on SOGCAST 1. And he talked about that day in extensive detail from his point of view. He was with Mike Tucker and Steve Perry, where the Americans with four or five indigenous troops from Spike Team Idaho. They went in looking for Idaho. They found no one. They had heavy contact. Everybody was wounded. They had one of their team members was killed in action. The team was pulled out, and this was the scene where you go in, and that moment in time, just one day, <laughs> where uh, you're riding in the chase ship. And we've never heard your side, but that brief time on the ground, I can't imagine all the bullets being shot around you as you went over. Can you talk a little bit about how you landed and then what you saw or didn't see? And of course, like we said, you were hoping to see somebody from Idaho, but you didn't. Well, Till, let me back up a little bit. Please uh, do. I, I was still assigned to <clears throat> RT Idaho. My promotion was pending. I was to go down to another uh, FOB and and uh, take charge of what they call a Leloy team. Leloy was a famous 
uh, warrior in the old uh, Vietnamese tribal wars. And uh, I hadn't left the compound. I was still assigned to RT Idaho. I was supposed to go on that mission, and Lane said, Spider, you're getting promoted. You get ready to go down to Contum, and uh, uh, Owen is ready. And we had Owen had trained with us. He'd had an, another tour in, uh, ahead of that and was ready to go. And Lane said, "You know, uh, you need you need to stay here and prepare to go. This, you know, I'll take Owen. Owen was ready, so I was okay with that. Uh, and then when we didn't hear from them, uh, I be, became adamant that I wanted to go. And then uh, uh, Colonel Bill Shelton said, Spider, you you can go on the chase ship.' I said, "Okay, that'll be enough." And uh, that's why I was on the chase ship. And of course, uh, I had a radio, uh, but I could I could only pick up the Fox mic. I couldn't hear the UHF and the VHF for the Spads and the, uh, and of course Probably. my Vietnamese wasn't good enough. It was good enough to tell the the pilot we go down now. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the LZ, there were there was plenty of smoke down there, but we we landed, we came in, and uh, and so I, just for clarity, you you told the King Bee to go down after Sternberg was out, so that team is out. No, no, but you didn't know they, it. They, or, where were you? They were still they were still on the ground. Okay, and we didn't know, and I didn't know what the what the uh, aviators were okay. talking about. Right, and then I I'd heard that. Uh, uh, the uh, Fox Mike broadcast that you know they were they were uh, the uh, <clears throat> the King Bees were coming in for pickup, so we were right behind them, and and of course Sternberg and the team were were at the bomb crater, I believe, and they he was he had. Steve Perry, because I think Tucker was wounded also, but uh, there was some confusion there, and then... And Steve was seriously injured. Yep. He was uh, paralyzed from the waist down at that it, moment he had, from a uh, hand grenade. Yeah, he, he had had one of the M26s or concussion, concussion grenades that had landed in there. But I landed about 40 meters from that bomb crater and was running over the other... Toward them, when the when he had thrown or just, well tossed uh, <laughs> Steve Perry on on the aircraft, and he had been shot in the arm. I could see him waving, and it looked like that he was flipping him off with his with his free hand. <laughs> and and Sturberg got shot in the right arm. In the right arm. But yes. he's left-handed. He's left-handed. So he's yeah. shooting, and he still found time yeah. to flip the bird yeah. to the NVA. That's yes. one of those golden moments in SOG history. And, of course, <laughs> I talked to Sternberg after that, but after that incident, they were all medevac back to Fubai. Uh, I had some shrapnel in the arm and stuff. It was minor stuff. And they couldn't take me at the FOB because the dispensary was full. And they... They took me off down to the uh, mass unit down in, down the street. Bill Shelton was on the PSP pad when we came back to Fubai, and he said, "Hey, Spider, you going down there and take care of that shit?" So, <laughs> and that's what it was. But yeah. and then I came back and found out that they had been further meta back uh, down to Da Nang, or I don't know if they went all the way back to Camp Zama, but about. A month later, we went down to be interviewed by some uh, by some intel types down in Saigon, and uh, Saigon had been recently hit with uh, uh, with a, a sapper attacks, and we stayed at the safe house, or I stayed at the safe house, house 10, ten, house ten, and then I went out to the uh, Tonsonut to the liaison board where Pappy Webb was out there, and I knew I could get some alcohol and and <laughs> poker. So 
uh, I went in. They didn't really want to talk to me much about about what went on in the, uh, in the white bright light uh, LZ. Okay. But I gave them that report. I don't know what happened to it. So let's back the tape up a little bit further then. Uh, when did you land in South Vietnam? And uh, this is after, of course, uh, just for the record, you and I met in the summer of 1967 at A Company, Special Forces Training Group, along with Tony Harrell, Rick Estes, Rick Howard, and a few other uh, luminaries, Ron Owens. But we went through training group together. Play, you and I played in the same softball team with Tony, and we played against uh, John McIntyre from Company B, beat them profoundly so and uh thanks to your pitching skills and uh so we had we knew each other from training group and so uh when you landed in vietnam i was still going through some tdy training back in the states but when did you land in vietnam then how when did you get assigned up to uh, fob1 i landed in vietnam uh just just after tet uh uh, uh 68. 68 and uh i uh i had gone voco <laughs> to uh up to fob1 by way of fob3 in caisson and i i had been reading about caisson in the in the front uh, page news of, of this siege sure. and i said you know i uh <laughs> That's why my dad said, "Don't volunteer for nothing." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> at any rate, I met Troll Sternberg up there a few days before I was able to get out of Caisson, and and uh, uh, that is another experience that I was so glad I was assigned to FOB one. Well, how long were you at Caisson? I, I mean, FOB three about was... a week. That's a week too long, right? Well, yes, it was. I I could tell you a little a story of what happened. Uh, <laughs> I, I was on a King B, and I had a I had an M16 and a duffel bag full of new uh, sterile fatigues that, right. that had no red dirt on them. And I looked around. The guy that was on the, the chopper with me was a guy named Valentine, and he looked completely red dirt and mud <laughs> and it, uh, he he needed to shave and, and the red dirt uh, yeah, was from caisson red dirt. yeah that from caisson he'd been on he'd been down to to uh saigon and was coming back up anyway here's what it's like the helicopter said we go down now and they just it's like being on a roller coaster they they Spiral. go down and then about 12 feet, 10 feet off the ground, I saw my duffel bag go out, and it's going end over end. I looked around and said, this is not my stop. And, of course, the, oh, the, door, the door gunner pushed me out, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they did not want to stay long. So no. I found my duffel bag, and nobody was out. Then a hand comes up out of, out of a bunker and says, Hey, hey, you, hey, expletive. Yes. <laughs> Come over here. Run. Run, mother sticker. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, so I start running over there, and I hear this boom in the background. And everybody's underground. And, and those are 122 rockets or mortars coming off of Korok Mountain, which is right outside of Quezon. Indeed. But that that was my introduction to Viet, to Vietnam, really. Oh, and and the reason why the King B didn't stay very long is because at that point in time during that Tet Offensive, any any aircraft that landed there generated enemy gunfire, mortars, yep. or in this case, one twenty two. At rockets. the airfield, you could see the remnants of a C forty seven blown apart. Whoa! And, and you could see that on on the ground. You knew that hey, this is Indian territory. <laughs> And I say that with respect to Indians, and Indeed. we'll get into that later on if you want to. We absolutely will. We'll talk a little bit more about the uh, Comanche experience, but getting back to uh, RT Idaho, ST Idaho. So you get back to Fubai, and somebody says through the process, introduces you to Glen Lane. How's that work? Um, well, I, I, the Sergeant Major. This is all in, due in, to me, too. Sergeant Major in, Enriquez at the time. 
uh, called us in and he said, uh, uh, I forget, we had started off from from uh, the SFOB in Natrang. That was about 15 people. When I got up there, there was about four of us on a chopper. And the sergeant major said, uh, uh, any of you had any recon experience? And of course, I said, well, I was in a recon tr reconnaissance troop in in uh, the 49th Armored Division when it was activated at Fort Polk, and I have a some experience in that, and I was also on a LERP with the 16th Infantry Rangers, and he was smiling, and he said, we got a place for you, Spider. <laughs> but anyway, it wasn't Spider at the time. Right. But I, I messed up. <laughs> but Enriquez was a super sergeant major, as, as were all of them there that we had. Yeah. So he then assigns you? Or... To RT Idaho. Right. And... Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the former members had uh, gone on a mission and decided that it wasn't for him. And, of course, there was no, nothing derogatory, but uh, they got him out of the FOB. Uh, Post-haste. Well, not not soon enough uh, to the Lane. Uh, Lane had to, had to fill me in and said, hey, uh, you know, he's leaving, and right. here's why. Anyway. And, more importantly, you're on a team. You get introduced to the team. And between that time and May of 68, you ran several missions with Glenn Lane as the one zero, and, uh, and no, I ran as the one one. Yeah, Glenn Lane was the one zero. Yes, you're the one one. We had s several Hey You missions. We, we had to experience uh, before you got there. Uh, uh, had to fill in for a guy on the hatchet force, but I went on two bright lights that I remember. Well, two bright lights. Yeah, one of them was the down, uh, hey you down pilot right outside of Hanoi, and uh, I think I gave a a story about this in John Plaster's book about a Mig twenty one flying underneath us, and and oh. and uh, one of the guys on sleep said, uh, uh, talking to Lane said, Lane, what what would you do if you saw a Mig? And he said, Well, I'd shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you better start because <laughs> that's a MiG. <laughs> anyway, it was something to yeah. that tune. But I I didn't really want to open up to John Plaster because I didn't know him. Right. But he was certainly a great Covey writer and a 1-0 uh, in his own right. And he did so much research there that I didn't feel the things I did were important enough to be in that book. Well, and just for the record, uh, we have interviewed John. And he will be on. He was on podcast number eleven, sodcast number eleven, and yes, he did three tours of duty, and uh, our listeners will enjoy that tape. But getting back to Spider Park story, so that's one bright light just outside of Hanoi. Were you able to get to the pilot? We did. No kidding. We had a heavy team. We we put up a. There was no one around it, and and uh, we couldn't get the pilot out. Uh, this is probably not probably not uh, appropriate to talk about, but uh, we have things called crispy critters, right? And that's what uh, you know jet fuel can do. And and if you want you want to take parts of that human remains out of that uh, cockpit, that would have been all we'd been able to do. And and Lane chose not to do it. I believe it was appropriate. Yeah, you were able to confirm the status of the pilot. The pilot sadly. was 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 confirmed dead, and uh, you know I don't know what the status that the family got, but uh, uh, again, they have this they have this status now with the DPAA that is uh, 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 confirmed dead, uh, BNR body not recovered, and. The body may have not been recovered because of the elements, because of uh, uh, right. because of of the crispy critter mode, and and uh, uh, another great aviator as 
you and I know we'd be fertilizer in Southeast Asia if it wasn't for the great aviators. Without a doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I, I've aviator. talked too much. I'm sorry. No, that's why you're here, because we're paying you the big bucks for that talk. Yeah. And we appreciate that. And Jocko Productions appreciates you taking the time to talk to us today. Absolutely. Well, well I'll be glad to meet Jocko in the paycheck. Thank you. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'd like to go back um, to the very beginning when you talked to your sergeant major and explained about your history a little bit, because this is a very unique time uh, for your in your life. And... Um, you joined the Army around 56, 57? 50, end of 57, 58. And um, just tell us a little bit about a couple of units. You had a very unique uh, company commander at one point, but uh, I, I wanted you to tell us about that so it's accurate. Company commander? Well, the 16th. That, that was a guy a, named Jack. Uh, the guy was a battle group commander. He was a full colonel. He was an OSS combat veteran, a uh, very famous uh, general, uh, Jack Sindlop. Who lives in Franklin, Tennessee today. Lives just, in Franklin, just, Tennessee. Just turned 100 years old last month. Still alive. I worked for him at three different occasions during my 30 years of, or more or less uh but I was in the Army Reserve when I came to Vietnam, which is not unique. And, of course, nowadays, uh, I had volunteered to go back on active duty in 1967 to go through operations and intelligence school and, and get my full flash for uh, Special Forces. Right. But it wasn't my first time with Special Forces or Rangers or Special Operations. Indeed. So you had that earlier time with those companies, and that's what led to that experience. That yes, brings to I Fort was Bragg. I was sent to Bad Toast, Germany, in 1959, at, as a uh, commo person, <laughs> and a a, a, a uh, long range patrol type ranger type. And of course, Bad Toast at that time was the headquarters for Tenth Special Forces. Tenth Special Forces Group. And the Cold War was at, in full. Full, yeah, full swing. They had indeed. dead A in, in Berlin, and I was privy to all of that. And, and of course, Colonel Feisenheimer, I believe, was the, was the group commander of, of the 10th group. And uh, there's some people that met me that are still alive. Uh, uh, another, another American Indian, uh, I call him a drugstore Indian, but, but he's a... <laughs> he's, uh, uh, that's Luke Emanuel. He knew me at at uh, Tenth Group when a lot of people said Spider couldn't have been there. But anyway, right. <laughs> uh, 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 so most of the most of the things that are not easily explained uh, uh, can be backed up by uh, you know by the appropriate liar. <laughs> <laughs> but also, so this so you can talk to you're not as. Uh, a store Indian, you're the real deal. No, I'm not. I'm a, I'm a part breed. I'm. Well, I am, that's okay, but but that's, I that's I have lived on a reservation. I slept with the horses. I grew up and and uh, uh, chewed that dirt with. But the reservation we were were on no longer exists. It was a, uh, it was kind of like a gypsy, uh, a gypsy band. There were. Comanches, Apaches, Navajos, Hoopies, Zunis, and all kinds of uh, Mexican and Mexican Indians. Uh, who my first language was Comanche. Indeed. Second language was slang Spanish. Third language was broken English and profanity. Indeed. So, which I'm still proficient at. Very proficient, and yeah. since then. You've also added how many more languages? Korean? Well, that, I learned German from being in Germany, and I went to a small German course. I went to the Defense Language Institute on three occasions. I learned Korean, uh, uh, limited fluency Russian, wow. and advanced <laughs> Spanish. Advanced. Yeah. And, you know, from that time on, on, your, on the reservation, that also led you to an experience 
where your time with horses and working with indigenous people really paid off. And you, this is like a little sidebar before we get back to Vietnam. But just one of those interesting stories where, because you grew up with horses, on one of your assignments, you were encountered horses. And could you just talk a little bit about that for a quick sidebar? Okay. Well, I'll try to make it. We were in <laughs> Colombia training the, the anti-terrorists in, in Bogota, Colombia, uh, training the police and military. They had a stable there. They had. We were doing a training exercise, and and my commander was down there with us. And uh, some of the people on our our uh, uh, special ops team that one of our companies had the same mission as the Delta Force has for the Central and South America, and many of the uh, were were had some experience with horses. The sergeant major at that time, a uh, friend of mine who went through O and I with me in '67, lost an eye in Vietnam uh, with SOG, uh, Francisco Medina. Uh, oh, I know that we, name. We were pretty much accomplished horsemen, and several of the other guys were. But the other guys, uh, they really couldn't go with us to, to help out with this exercise we were on. And that sort of bonded with the uh, with the people we were working with in Colum in Bogota at that time. And you're uh, in the mountains. You're working uh, with uh, some uh, local indigenous people. Yeah, we are, we had later on, and around I was it in the eighties when the Palace of Justice was came down. <laughs> uh, that contact that our company had with those people. And my commander, I, I'm not sure if this is still classified, but the uh, the takedown of the ju uh, of, of the ju Palace of Justice, uh, the third of the seventh, had a lot to do with that. So, indeed, that, enough enough said. Well, maybe we'll we'll come back a little later. But but here the key element was on this exercise, you and a couple other special forces soldiers. Yes. Worked with the indigenous troops and your experiences with horses helped you to ingratiate yourself. As Establish a rapport, Till. <laughs> Indeed. But that's that's just like one of the little sidebars. Yeah, well, just, uh, you know, and, and that's not unheard of. I, I, folks in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, some of the reserve special forces guys were were really into that that uh, you know the horse soldiers indeed and my heart goes out to them they you know i salute them yeah whereas the majority of the people in the horse story horse soldier story they weren't horsemen you guys were and it helped to ingratiate you with the people you were well, working I, with. I think some of those guys were horsemen and they had, well, they were. They they had were. skills there were a few well but, i must tell you this my father was in the horse cavalry. He was in the old guard. Is that right? Yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. Old that, guard? That's an, that's an, okay, well, they, let's that's get back That's in Arlington Vietnam. Cemetery, but he, he was in the horse cavalry. I, of course, uh, our, our family is so uh, dysfunctional, which nowadays that's, that, you know, uh, that's a uh, uh, mental health term, and Indeed. It's, but it's appropriate. Indeed. But so uh, we took that little sidebar. So let's get back to Vietnam, back to FOB1. Uh, STRT Idaho is now missing in action. They come to you say, Spider, you're not going to go to Contum. We're going to make you to 1-0 of Idaho. And that's where you and I met, or we met, actually. Let's back up a little Let's bit. Let's back up. That's why I pay you the big bucks. Colonel Shelton, Colonel Roy Barr, Major Jacks, uh, Major Clyde Sincere said, Spider, you want to keep Idaho, the name of Idaho, and stay on Idaho, or you want to change the name? I went to the interpreter, because here's the word. And, and I'll say this a little bit. I had some notes here, but I've had a charmed life. <clears throat> so has hip. 
our interpreter. He and I, for some reason, he wasn't on that mission. I was not on that mission. And the other folks that are assigned to Idaho, uh, Sal and Fook, people right. that you met later on, they determined that Spider's lucky. He ain't good, but he's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, of course, uh, they knew that I had some recon skills because I believe I did. You did. At, and we, uh, we improved on the uh, SOP that Lane had so hardly worked on, or not hardly worked on, but so worked on so hard. And one of the things that we always, all of the teams that, Network together and got in, at, you know, after duty or it when appropriate to to think about. Hey, what works in the bush, man? What are you doing right? Right. And we shared those things. And that would be the the main sharing ground would be the clubhouse. Yeah, or the on mess hall, or a mess hall, sure. the mess hall, and and or out there on in the company uh, gravel pit or yard. Uh, the firing range, wherever. But we shared that information. And and one of the things was stay off trails, you know. Yeah, that's the golden and, rule. And, yeah, and, and we'll talk about that later on. Sure. Uh, but at any rate, we came back. Uh, I took Hip with me, and I said, hey, hell no, we're keeping Idaho. Idaho's our team, and we're going to keep it. And then a few days later, you came in, or you were already there. You passed RT Idaho going out on that mission. You might want to talk about that. <laughs> well, I've, we've mentioned it before quickly. When I landed at FOB1, me, Johnny McIntyre, and John Hutchins, uh, the three of us, King Bee came in, landed. And, of course, that was our first time we ever flew in a King Bee. And they gave <laughs> us that initiation, come up Highway 1, heading north, flip it on its side. <laughs> it's like, holy shit, what's going on? <laughs> but we survived that. We landed. Idaho gets on and disappears into history, SOG history, a tragic chapter therein. And uh, so they disappear. They attempt to find them. They can't. The bright light gets shot up. You're on the ground with shrapnel wounds, etc. And then you become the one zero. And the thing I remember is that training. You and, of course, Don Wolken was the assistant team leader. And uh, uh, he he came on the team. And that's when we started all that training. And you just worked us. I worked us hard. Then we had the monsoons, the bags. And then our uh, we did a practice mission, a night ambush. And then we had our first real mission where you're the one zero. And they augmented the team to insert Air Force sensors into the asphalt. We had one more prior to that. Remember when they sent that team in with us? They got in a firefight. Well, you they, told me that was a practice mission. It wasn't for real. <laughs> it was for it was, real. Oh, it was on the east side of the <laughs> No, it was, it was real. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you done good, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I may be slow, but I got there. <laughs> uh, yes. And the other team that was parallel to us, they ambushed the path that Lao ambush. They... Uh, they got run out after they ambushed the ambush they they <laughs> got they got run out and we stayed in another couple of nights and and uh, the the headshed thought we were great but we you know we were just <laughs> well, kind of uh moving around in place and and not uh, you know not not really uh, moving too far but uh we were told just you just go in there and yeah, and area, we, area yeah, we did we did did have a little remember that area we landed on where <laughs> where uh, we won't go into any more about that we but it was a it was detail. a big open area and they had a, something like a gravel road we watched that road a little bit we did I yep. remember that part and yep. then that was my first exposure to Laotian the mosquitoes. <laughs> in the morning, I could barely open my eyes. I had been eaten alive by the mosquitoes. That well, day. you you guys from New Jersey just didn't didn't have it all together. We didn't. We're <laughs> the city slickers. <laughs> <laughs> so after that first successful mission, which I thought was a practice mission all those years, thank you for the clarification, Sergeant. Um, then the Air Force sensors, and that mission, you were the one zero augmented with Les Daniels from. Uh, uh, RT Rhode Island mm -hmm. 
And then we had Bob Ross came in from S3. And I forget why those two gentlemen had worked with the equipment and they were there to augment the team. But you were the one zero took us in and maybe talk a little bit about what that mission was. We had the main computer, all, everything was buried, and then two more coaxial cables that went out to lesser sensors that could pick up motion on the trail. Well, that's why Ross and, and I believe, uh, I don't know if it's Hal Falk, the other guy, but... but uh, Les Daniels. That, Les, Les Daniels was, was with us to insert. Right, okay. But we inserted them. They turned them on and made sure that we didn't screw them up. Right. And they were out there, you know, to, to do that. But uh, uh, they said, Spider, you're going to be in charge. You're going to be the one, one zero. I said, okay. I said, I'd, I'd rather not go out with someone you know that maybe their first second mission on the ground or whatever but ross and falk were great people and and uh, they they helped us but you remember when we buried those things there was an antenna sticking up right and when we the reason we didn't get killed on the way in is because they couldn't lower the AA guns low enough. They they thought the 101st was coming in, and they were going to be coming in at oh, 3,000. That right? That's the reason. <laughs> we came in right off the – and remember, you guys uh, had your last rights the night before because we we're, we're going to land on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And we're, we're gonna, you in know, the asshole. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we were yeah, pretty certain that we were yeah, going to be dead yeah, within 24 hours. Yeah. And uh, the, the reason we got in and is out is because we came in low. Uh, and that was with the first cab on that mission. No, that was the 101st. The choppers might have been from the first cab. Okay. But the 101st came in, and remember, we went up to LZ Bastogne. Right. We laid there, and we were panting, you know, <laughs> drinking water. And here's the funny story that I remember. They had a they had a tent up there, and here comes this captain with a flak jacket and a steel pot running over to where we were laying there on the ground, you know, getting our yeah. breaths back, said, who are these people? Where are your steel pots? Where are your flak jackets? My God, you haven't shaved. <laughs> and who's in charge here? And and I believe it was you. So I, but that'd be Spider. He says, Spider, who is Spider? What is, <laughs> and anyway, he's a, you know, I get up. I'm, I, I didn't call him sir or anything. We were in sterile fatigues. And he looked around at all our little people with gold teeth and and uh, better weapons than they had. Absolutely, <laughs> the Car 15s. Yeah. And he said, "Who? What? What's going on? Who's in charge here?" And then here comes a major out of the headquarters. Says, "Says, where's Spider?" General Zeiss wants to talk to Spider. <laughs> <laughs> and then this captain almost locked his heels. He said. Uh, so I went over there, and, and what he's telling me, he said, he said, maybe five minutes after you put those sensors in, we started picking up transmissions. He said, I don't know if they were deer or rabbits or, or NVA coming, but we got, he said, you guys did a great job. Get on out of here. But that, no was, that, that was the 101st commander. Whoa. And, you know, I'd forgotten that completely. Yeah, well, don't you remember that Not cap at all. captain running over? Oh, yeah. Well, maybe it wasn't you. <laughs> it may not have been. May have been another white guy. Might have been. Too. Might yeah. have. Might have been Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> but so, Daniels is another American Indian. He's a. Oh, he's he's a, great, a Ute. Is that right? Yep, right out of Colorado. I, I got to, I got to link up with him later on. So. Oh no, kidding! Because Les Daniels was. For the record, probably one of, if not the best one zeros in camp. Better than me. Oh, better than all of us for sure. Great guy. Um, so then in September, Idaho put in another set of sensors up by Quezon. I forget. Were you the one zero for that? Was no, that, I that was not. Was no, no, no. It must have been Don Walken okay. or, or you. No, no, not me. It was Don because uh, yeah. that was September up by Highway 9. Idaho became sort of a... a uh, uh, best horse, uh, use you know, uh, <laughs> use your best donkeys and and uh, guys that seem to have a charmed uh, existence. Well, 
We ran that mission, and also during that time, we had some monsoons. So the team was inactive, a lot of duty in, in, in the camp. And then finally, we come to uh, October the 5th when ST Alabama is inserted. And uh, they had an inexperienced 1 0 team leader, and they went in with a nine man team. The second helicopter went in with Lynn Black and some indigenous troops from ST Alabama. And Lynn told the inexperienced 1 0, there's a NVA flag here, it's at least a battalion, we're nine, we should leave now. The Vietnamese team members told the 1 0, we should leave now. He said no. And then he committed the mortal sin, which we referenced earlier. He walked down, he led the team down a trail. They walked into an L shaped ambush where they were ambushed by 50 NVA, killing two members of the team right away. The team leader who made the wrong decision and tragically a really good point man was killed instantly. Firefight went on. It commenced all day. And at this point, yourself and Spider Parks, uh, Spider Parks, you are. Pat Watkins were flying Covey that day for the entire day, relaying Camo from the team on the ground with Lynn Black talking to you and you and or Pat Watkins directing airstrikes all day. And uh, first, just we've talked about it a little bit in the book, Across the Fence, but for you, what are a couple of things that stick out in your mind? And then I think it was near the end of the day, you had one of those moments in life that you'll never forget where you almost had a mid-air collision. Well, first of all, Tilt, we, uh, I was flying Covey. We were both out there. Uh, I was a Covey rider. I wasn't, I'm not a Covey pilot. Covey pilots could do everything that Covey riders could do and more. And, but here's the thing. Pat was, was uh, uh, I believe he was with uh, 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 Covey 256, maybe 254. Uh, they were there about bingo on gas, and they couldn't stay as long and as we. Bingo means low on fuel. Yep, yep. Anyway, he, uh, he had, we had told James Stride and uh, Go out on a VR and you pick your own LZ. Don't don't pick the one that's that's been appointed for you. And we think that there's a mole somewhere, and if we shared that information. I said, uh, even that early in May, yeah, 68. wow. But but even uh, the the fact that uh, he did not want to listen was really. Uh, detrimental to what happened to the, you know to that team and then i got the uh i i got on the horn or on the fox mic radio with lynn black and he's saying the one two is down i think he's dead and then i lynn will tell you this that i told him said well check him out I said, you, you're not a medic are you now anyway come to find out he wasn't he was not dead he was praying and of course uh, that's not the time you need to put that in a different compartment to get on but there's so many things that went wrong the weather was bad they went in a hole and aircraft was stacked up high and that's why we almost had a mid-air co collision with too many aircraft in there and of course pat watkins i and i were both over jolly green one zero which was piloted by a uh, an air a, a pilot from the great services known as the Coast Guard, <laughs> and we watched that B forty rocket as it went into that chopper, did an, a, a, a dive, flip flipped over, and crashed into the jungle. And the ERC-10 radio, the emergency radio came up. I thought no one could have survived that crash. And it was the PJ off of Jolly Green 1-0. Wow, yeah. And, uh, of course, that story in your book takes up a lot of uh, appropriate time to to deal with it correctly. And and uh, I'll never forget that day. But uh, I'll never forget the day that... that uh, 
uh, Lane and Owen were missing. There's several other turning points, uh, Marble Mountain, of course, and and uh, uh, New Year's Day. Seems like uh, a lot of a lot of things happened on. Well, on yeah, that. if we could, uh, let's, I agree. We're going to go to each one of those. So, but the specificity for that one moment in time, people hear about TAC air, air cover, working and how difficult it is. And like you said, on that day, uh, the team was in trouble early in the morning. They were on the ground the entire day until you all got them out. You and Pat working with all the air assets, which includes A1 Sky Raiders, Air Force Fast Movers. We lost another King Bee. That Jolly Green went down. A second Jolly Green was shot up so bad that after they extracted the and team. An F-4. And did they lose an F-4? I believe they did. But we got them out at last light. Right. Uh, Watkins had, had had to go back for gas, if you remember. Absolutely. Yep. And But what, Watkins is much better covey rider than me he's 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 the one i hate for <laughs> I hate and love but he recommended that i uh, leave the team and and be a, a covey rider but and just uh, for the record you two both were outstanding covey riders so from from being on the ground talking to you all saving our bacon i can say that for the record but uh, the, the moment in time on that mission for you at one point you almost you and your pilot almost had a mid-air collision. Yes, with an F four. An F four turned and, us on our side and and uh, loosened the uh, the marking rockets on my side of the airplane. It had, had rockets, <laughs> but the the uh, the rocket pod was useless after we landed, and I don't know how it stayed on. But but yes, it was close. And it was that close because, and people don't realize with a jet moving several hundred miles an hour past you, just the force of that air alone, not only did your aircraft bounce, but it was damaged. Yes. And, okay, so that's a moment in time. So as part of your history, on August the 22nd, you were down in Da Nang for a promotion board and this was this led to a major uh, we we didn't realize it on the 22nd but in the early morning hours of the 23rd there was a severe attack on FOB4 in Da Nang and you had gone downtown to our safe house that night and you came back in the morning to see the carnage yes and if you could talk a little bit about how after the Viet Cong and NVA sappers had planned an attack for over a year they launched it in the early light, early morning, no moonlight, and they ultimately killed 16 Green Berets at that base and others. And we lost dozens of indigenous, and the NVA that came in wore headbands and said, we came to die, and they did. And so after that night of fighting, you came in. What did you see at FOB4? Well, we were at House 22, which was a... a uh, Safe a house. safe house, and and uh, I, they were showing a movie at at uh, FOB four, and I told Pat Watkins that we ran to the uh, to the uh, transit hooches, which were in partial partially being built, but we wanted to get close to the shower. Uh, the rooms closest to the shower were already occupied. One of the rooms that we liked when we were down there, we stayed at before, was near the shower, and Lieutenant Potter was already in there, oh, and really? a couple of the others. Yeah. Well, that is like having a charmed life because that room was destroyed and Lieutenant Potter was killed. In his bed. At, in his bed right there at, at that at that point but we moved down the hall and i put my rucksack in there and then i said hey pat uh, yep yep I said hey pat why don't you let me take your <laughs> your swedish k automatic nine millimeter with me because you know i'm going down there and there's some bad guys out that way i said you guys are going to be here you know and and Same. he he had a forty five caliber pistol. I had a I had a thirty eight because it was in my uh, 
uh, my uh, Air vest. Force flight vest, and I was hey you'd when I got back off a of mission said you're going down to the promotion board, and, and of course I didn't get to bring any clean fatigues or anything down there. I just got my I usually <laughs> carried my uh, car 15 and hand grenades and all that. I, down there with a 38 and six loose rounds and oh. uh, and i so i had uh, uh i had watkins uh two magazines and a in a uh and a uh swedish k yeah so i took that down at about i guess about two thirty, three o'clock in the morning we got we got a, a guy a couple of guys tried to get in the house 22 and and the gate guards there fired them up then we got the word that that fob4 and ccn was under fire we got on a three-quarter ton and drove to there at the as morning was breaking and they let us in we went up by the uh uh went up by the dispensary where people were laid out there there was still fire there's still sappers we went down the fence line. I ran into Watkins, and of course he hugged me, and then and then wanted to strangle me because I had his automatic weapon. <laughs> he had to use his well, forty-five. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what happened to Watkins and Varney? Varney was on the chopper with us. They they were smart enough to hide behind their mattresses when the uh, when the sapper rolled a hand grenade down the hallway and blew it in. And then Pat went outside and killed that sapper with his 45. Then uh, they got they got behind some uh, I guess it was a, some sand piles or or sandbags. And then Watkins told me that they were getting fire from the Como bunker. And uh, uh, there was a a captain. Pfeiffer, who had thrown a grenade over maybe 50 yards or yeah, more. Yeah, long distance. He long had a strong distance. arm. And, and uh, Varney had got up to to tell the people inside the combo walkers, hey, we're Americans, but they were already sappers in there, and, and he got shot. So he was killed. And, and uh, Watkins and I went on down after – sunrise we were down just before sunrise i guess there was some there was two nva sappers when their uh, uh, line lawn cloths and and they were in our latrines right our wooden you know latrines. latrines yeah and they had locked arms and they were getting fired up i believe uh, doug gotchall had walked down there with us because we were picking up stragglers, there was no organized, uh, organized defense as as you would have it. And Watkins took charge of that. He said, "Hey, we're going to go here. We got to prepare for a counterattack." Nobody thought. I didn't think about a counterattack, but he did. And he said, "You know," he said, "We're going to." So we we took these stragglers down and uh, uh, firing inside that. Uh, th- that uh, shitter, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it blew apart. They had laid together and pulled the pin on a hand grenade and killed themselves. Now those guys were dedicated. They were, you know, oh yeah. Uh, of course, to them that was a, their mission and it was worth dying for. We can, you know, we were doing the same things. We, we didn't want to die, but you know, when it come to it, you, you know, you and I, we had our SOP. We had our final rounds. We had our, we had our Less nine hand millimeters. Hand. <laughs> we had our hand grenades, and uh, you know, not going to be taken alive. So wow. that, when you fighting those kind of people, I mean, grudgingly respect that. Hey, they did what what they were fighting for. However, uh, you know, why so didn't I have no remorse in squeezing the trigger? None. So, yes, that. Uh, so you were there for that historic moment. Yes, for you that. You were there with Lynn Black. Uh, I, October you know, 5th. I should have been there, but I, <laughs> I would have probably been in Lieutenant Potter's bunk. But anyway, I believe I've had a charmed uh, life. Without a question, 
And then two days after, October 5th, I'm biased on this, just to wander for a second. You and Pat Watkins, again, as Covey Riders, were over our team when uh, we finally made contact with you all. And you provided uh, great coverage for us, coordinated the air. And again, we got out last night with uh, Captain Tin pulling us out. And then other moments in time, which would include Christmas Day, which was one of the most unusual uh, transmissions I ever had. I was on the ground, we're in contact, and you said, we got an intel report, do not go to the Northeast. And you had talked to the Frenchman. Yes, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, he said, don't move, don't move a hair. Tell those guys, you know, tell those guys, just don't tell them why, because, you know, another thing that we we didn't pay enough attention to is the ability of the NVA to RDF. They they were masters at that. that you know, after a few transmissions, uh, they yeah, were able to get... And the RDF know is Radio Direction yeah. Finders. Yeah. So they were able to triangulate. If yeah. they had, if you were on the FM radio for just a short amount of time, like Doug's case, he wanted to remain clandestine. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he gave me the right info, and, and I, he said, just relay it. And I said, yes, sir, private. <laughs> <laughs> you and Doug Letourneau are private PFCs. <laughs> right. So um, we'll go fast ahead for, for one week. On New Year's Eve, 68, team is inserted. You went out, gave them a team okay. You came back a little bit concerned uh, because it was New Year's Eve. We won't talk about your concerns, but you came back, and in the morning, you flew out early again to check in with the team. And that was where was one of the first times we had a recon team on the ground hit by sappers. Yeah. And so, again, this is another one of those sad but historic moments that you, you're directly involved. I was on the radio with, uh, I believe that was uh, Lavon. Or who is the other? But Halls and Hall. Halls. Because yeah. we knew Halls. They were from, Canadians. They were. Yeah. But he, he said, wait. And I heard AK fire in the background. And I just started shaking my head because I never got another transmission from him. Wow. And that's where the whole team, uh, th there were no Indians killed. Is that right? Yeah. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And and that fine crew chief from the hundred and first that went down on the string and tied the bodies. No, I wasn't. I've forgotten that part. Well, they took them down to to uh, to F to FOB four and remember Colonel Warren. You, you talk you, but there we've got too many stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, these are. The SOG stories that you were directly involved in. Yes. And and more. And more. And so I would, we've gone through some of that. And so for your remaining tour of duty, you and I were together at FOB4 at CCN after they closed FOB1. But I seldom saw you because you're busy doing what down there? You're wrapping up your tour of duty. And up on chin strap. <laughs> up the where... Uh, uh, up, up where uh, 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 Larry Trimble's team was up there, and I was up there with another FOB. I didn't want to hang around the head shed. I <laughs> thought I'd get hey you again. Indeed. <laughs> and you know what hey you is for our audience is, you know, you're standing around doing nothing, and uh, uh, you can explain it better than me. But you've been hey you. Yeah, too hey you. You to have too, Tom. <laughs> well, I'm told. <laughs> and uh, so from here, I'd like to go back to something we skirted over when you were talking. Maybe we can't go into too much detail now, but you, when you were in Bogota, there was another, this is a changing gears. We're going from SOG now to years later. You're in Bogota, and you quickly mentioned the Hall of Justice had been overrun by terrorists. And you were there at that moment in time. Could you talk just a little? I, got, I wasn't there when it happened, but I got there later on. It's kind okay. of like when I got into FOB4, <laughs> you know, charmed life. <laughs> Indeed. But that was, um, 
a moment in time where you're still, were you still with the third or seventh then? The 37. Okay. And so you're down there and that was where the terrorists took over the Hall of Justice in Bogota. They killed the justices, yes. Wow. They executed, I don't know how many uh, Supreme Court justices. But of, of the assignments I've had, Till, uh, mm-hmm. the third of the seventh and the duty up in El Salvador, either other countries training their armies, training their uh, uh, civilian defense forces, uh, going to Argentina, getting to travel on the parachute team to every country in Central and South America except Chile. Uh, the third of the seventh of the two tours I had there, the tour in, in the first group, in the first of the first in Okinawa, finest assignments I've had except for the one at Fubai. <laughs> Yeah, that was a little different, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, a little different. But nonetheless, that's a special forces career that's really, you're too modest to say it, but I'll say it, is exemplary. And that's why we're here today. I'm just honored to have you with us to talk about that. And, uh, you know, during that time, you also spent some time in Korea. And I yes. remember there was at least one poster that was made from May 6th, like 98 or 99, when you had participated in a major jump, your jump demonstration team had jumped into Korea, and you had talked a little bit about your time in Korea with uh, another unique assignment. Well, I I uh, I left Panama just before Just Cause. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, by the way, one of my one of my. Uh, uh, Acquaintances, one of my jump personnel or jump trainees was Manuel Noriega. Uh, he no. had, he had, yes, I have pictures of, of that to prove that. But Manuel would was a, a skydiver, and he loaned us his aircraft for weekend practice jumps along with <laughs> the Panamanian jump team. Really? Yes. <laughs> uh, but I'd also had made friends with some famous skydivers in Korea, and we had a Commander's Cup jump in in Korea. I got to meet uh, a lot of uh, Korean uh, 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 high-ranking officers and their special warfare folks, and, of course, SFDK, Special Forces Detachment Korea, took me under their wing and, and allowed me to jump with them as a reservist, so uh, <laughs> I retired reserve. Anyway, yes, uh, uh, I, I hope that wouldn't compromise any of the people in that time frame. But I was assigned as the garrison uh, sergeant major, as a command sergeant major of uh, Camp Page, Korea, and they had a, a, a fine compound there. Uh, 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 then later on, after I retired, I became a garrison commander of Camp Hialeah in Pusan, Korea. So, wow. but those are those are two long stories, and and uh, <laughs> uh, it just you know, some of the guys in Alabama said, "Hey, hey Spider, you Forrest Gump." And I, I said, "Anyway, uh, uh, I said I can back it up." <laughs> okay. Indeed. Indeed. So, uh, but. I, I'm about worn out. Let's wind this thing up, Till. Well, we're not, well, we will uh, in a few minutes here. But you know, I think that uh, after your time in the army, it was also a, a period where your service to our country and then to veterans, where you went on to get high, get educated. You became a doctor, Parks, and then you worked with the VA for 15 years working with veterans. Well, I didn't work with the VA. I worked for the Department of Army as a behavioral scientist, a substance abuse professional, uh, testing, training, uh, uh, education, and therapy. But that that took a long time. But but remember this: I came back in the Army. I was on my way to be a public health professional. I had served in every department of the Dallas City and County. This is before you. Before, before I. Yes. B- before, before I came back 
on 67 to go get my uh, my the toughest course I ever took was the Special Forces O and I. But I was going to school at night. The 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 uh, department was educating me and grooming me to be a public health officer. Officer, I went worked with meat, milk, food investigation, animal control, right. vector control, VD investigation. Really? <laughs> really? Yes, really. Uh, 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 and and it was a, a you know it was it was an interesting occupation. Indeed. I, I had planned to go do a year in Vietnam and come back to the health department, but something happened, the bonding, the fellowship, and knowing that I get to travel, I get to go to language school, I get all this. I'm not going back to Dallas, Texas. And here's another thing. I was born at the hospital that John F. Kennedy died at. Parkland. Parkland Hospital. I was downtown in City Hall when he got shot. Really? Yes. And <laughs> one of the officers that got killed was a high school friend of mine. And in 1980, 81, uh, his son was in my company in the 82nd Airborne when I was the first sergeant in the 82nd. And wow. he was killed by his wife. So, oh wow, this <laughs> <laughs> the story could go on. So yeah. the eighty second was part of your career. Yes, yeah, so you ultimately became. Of, a, yes, yeah. yeah. You became a command sergeant major, and how many different posts did you actually serve as a command sergeant major? I actually, uh, Panama and Korea, uh, Camp Page, yeah. and a third of the seventh in Panama. That's the only two. Only two. Yeah. The only two. Yeah. Well, it's out, again, it's outstanding, and uh, <laughs> the modesty factor here. And then uh, continuing on, the last fifteen years, through your American Legion post in Huntsville, again you're on a special detail there, where you continue to go to honor our veterans when they pass away. In fact, you had a funeral yesterday, did you not, or two days ago? Day before yesterday, yes, yes sir. In in the thirteen years we've done over twelve hundred funerals for veterans. I serve as the uh, deputy commander of the Post Two Thirty Seven American Legion Honor Guard. Indeed, and, uh, and and I'm also on the POWMIA team for the Joint Special Operations. Yes. Hey, I got too many stories. Well, you, that's we're we're not complaining about that, and then. Uh, the the other side of the spider coin that we didn't talk about at all too was you've played a little sports in your day so even when you're in high school in ninth grade because back in your school as a way they were transitioning to a new high school you as a ninth grader wound up in high school and you were on the football team and you went on to have a career in athletics that's where we met playing softball but still, you've played football, baseball, and many years playing fast pitch long after most fast pitchers have retired. <laughs> I had to play baseball in Korea. Mm -hmm. to play. Played on a minor league baseball team in Korea up, up until my late 60s. Wow. So, well, <laughs> mid-60s. Uh, played on semi-pro football team in in uh, Pittsburgh, Lemister their first year. Was that right? Yep. We were at tenth group at uh, Fort Devens. Yep, that's right. Indeed, they uh, they played teams like the Long Island Bulls. The uh, uh, played Park League teams in in Boston and the prison team. I remember that out in out in uh, Concord. So, yeah, that it's it's been a wonderful life, Till. It has, and uh, you're a part of a very unique niche in history during the eight year secret war you served in that war for your year put your time in with many amazing stories and there are people that are alive today thanks to your service you and pat watkins when you're flying as a uh, covey riders and uh i know that uh you're inclined to wrap it up here but as we do so as you reflect back on those years you've also had a personal Effort. I don't know how much detail we can go into, but for example, the hat you're wearing today is unique 
because that hat has traveled with you. It's a special operations association hat that has traveled with you when you went to Laos, when you returned to Vietnam, in an effort to try to help any way at all to locate our team members, team members, and at least the remains. And uh, you traveled at least back there once with Tony Harrell. Yes. And uh, if you could maybe just talk a little bit about that, because that gives a reflection of your commitment and devotion to our teammates that we lost in 1968. Well, of course, uh, the haunting experience and the uh, the personal uh, passion that I have for wanting to find the guy that replaced me when I should have been on that mission, and Glenn Lane, what a great base he gave me as a to be a one zero. Uh, that's uh, you know that's that's a, a passion that I I can't deny, and I have been able to travel uh, many times. Uh, due to uh, due to uh, uh, due to my health and uh, due to having enough made enough money and having enough funds donated to to allow me to travel and I have a have a couple of businesses one in one in the Philippines and and one in Korea and uh, I've had help from many different people over there. I have uh, decided that that I want to dedicate my life to humanitarian efforts and instead of trying to bomb and kill people. Uh, and, but I you know I can go into that as you know philosophically, but uh, that would take probably the rest of the day till <laughs> and and, and uh, you know we need to wrap it up. We do, and uh, but also from a first-hand basis, you and I were together in the Ashaw Valley, and you have since returned there. Where now there's a hotel. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that used to be a Green Beret A camp. They yeah. now have an, a hotel. Yeah, the Louis Airfield and and uh, uh, Tabat Airfield. I've crash landed on on uh, Louis, and you can see that from the. Weekend market where the hotel is in the Ashow Valley, really, and they've got paved parts of the of of, of the Ho Chi, Ho Chi Minh Trail. No, yes. Now you said you crash landed there in an O two. Yes, the front engine was shot out. <laughs> Just another day in, in the, another in the day in no, another day in, in, in you know another day in Nam nah, man. Indeed, <laughs> and then also. Uh, as we close out, you have uh, dabbled with music. A little and, bit. And you've put together a couple songs that, uh, although we're not, we may not have the link today, but we'll post it where people can go to songs that you've composed. Um, and that music, you've tied it into Sog and a couple to Recon. And who is the story about you gaining some of your early? inspiration for music came in 1968 and from two unique men could you just before we wrap up could you share a little bit of that and then how we if people are interested in spider songs where well, we can lead them to at some point well, tilt you were in that room with me when we were playing the guitars you remember the chaplain played guitar i remember grady spry famous <laughs> airborne chaplain we used to drink a six pack of beer and and play that. country western of course uh, i was interested in country western and rock but there were well, two see, don't forget back then the headsets were only one year yeah. <laughs> so in one year i had the vanilla fudge and the cream and the doors and other year i'm listening to you guys do country country western so i had a very dichotomous well, we, musical experience you know i played you. more more country uh, rather more rock and roll Indeed. Uh, uh, these two gentlemen who were younger than me younger than you i believe uh stan uh Seating and Richard, Richard Fitz, Fitz, who took that, money from me in a poker game, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. well, his son became a rock star. Richard Fitz Jr. Yeah, and 
I've played with him also. Is that right? At, at SOAR, you saw me sitting over there. That was a long time ago. Yeah, anyway, long -term Richard memory. Fitz could play the guitar and sing. Yes. Yeah. Stan seating likewise. And we played rock songs, and we changed the words to them because, well, you were in the Nam, man. We're in Vietnam. Yeah. But the high heel sneakers, you know. So give us a little bit of a hint that, of that. So uh, from uh, high heel uh, sneakers, instead of putting on your high heel sneakers, you put on a... Put on your flak jacket, brother, because yeah. <laughs> we're going down the trail. Or we're going out tonight. Put on your steel pot, brothers, because we're going out to fight. <laughs> and we put that to the tune of put on your high heel sneakers. Indeed. And the other song, I kind of put in one of a, of a, a progression of chords that I use for the Black Rifle Coffee song that's right i forgot about but that. i i had that that progression for don't go down that trail it's a highway to hell and you know <laughs> that's part of our sop <coughs> don't go down any trail that's right don't cut down no grass it might show where we passed you know <laughs> but stuff like that that's sort of you know i've had a penchant for that i'm not any good i got a scratchy to a voice and an out of tune guitar <laughs> but maybe we'll have to connect you with the uh, the folks that put together the SOG video game, SOG Prairie Fire video game, because they're always looking for music. Well, that you know, I, I think your music I, might be a good am, fit there. I I'm from my my musician partner and the brains of the outfit, Randy Grave was an Army musician. He's been on the he's on the honor guard for post two two nine. We have combined because we don't have enough old people to do funerals oh is that right yeah wow well and so what we'll do is uh, i'll afterwards. play you a couple of songs when we get through here <laughs> very good and then what we'll do is um uh we'll uh, get that music and get the word out and i will talk to people from savage games that put together the sog Prairie Fire video game that's now out on the market based off and it pays homage to, to SOG and the men that were in it. And we will go forward with that from there. Well, this should be a tribute to the memory of, of Stan Seating and Richard Fitz. And, and we, we're not, Randy and I are not doing this for money. We're doing it for historical preservation. Indeed. And, uh, uh, we have to say that Richard Fitz was one of seven Green Berets who were killed November 30th, 1968. They were on a, an Elder Son mission, which was yeah. a mission. Arthur Bader. Art Bader was there from New Jersey. Uh, 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 he's the man I remember the most. I remember Fitz because he took money from me in a poker game. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but Art Bader, I remember him because of his New Jersey link. Now he and, was in 67 and, and, and with us at Fort Bragg also. Is that right? See, I'd forgotten yep. that. But yep. I got mission, him out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten that too. So what we have, so on that mission though, November 30th, Richard Fitz went, went down with the King Bee. And uh, their remains weren't uh, recovered until uh, 20 plus years later. Yep. But they are now resting. Uh, let's Arlington. talk about Richard Jr. or Richard's son. Uh, he has a video and he has a memorial to that. It's called 23 Years and a Folded Flag, right. something like that. And we may see him this October. We hope so at the Special Operations Association reunion in Vegas. And uh, before we have a final, any final closing thoughts from you, sir? Thank you. And with that, we want to thank all the veterans out there today. Men like Robert J. Spider Parks, who fought for the ideals of our country. Truly an American hero. To those of you out there on the front lines now, we thank you for fighting for all that we care for and for our values today. And this recording is September the 2nd, and it's been a more difficult time in our country's history with uh, Afghanistan and the families that are caught up in all of this, our service members. We 
special, we pay special tribute to them, as well as all of our service members, police, law enforcement, border patrol, secret service, and we want to thanks to all who live, and for those who did not return, we have a special salute for them, and uh, for those that didn't come home. And today we close out, again we thank Spider Parks, thank you for your service to our country, sir, and to all our people out there today. God bless America. Amen. And now for one of my favorite uh, duties with our top secret agent, our technician, Tom, who we can't reveal his identity because obvious reasons. He's just too busy these days. But most importantly, we're here now to talk about SOGCAST number 12 with one of my all-time brothers, uh, friend, man, mentor, uh, et cetera, Robert J. Spider-Parks. So what was your impression, sir, for the first time to meet the live and live, our living legend? It was amazing. Um, as usual, meeting any of, the, any of the guys from SOG for me. But uh, Spider especially, because I've read so many, so many books, and everywhere in there, in every book I think I've read yeah. is Spider-Parks. And it was like meeting a legend. You know, it's like, I've met him. Here's the legend. You know, and it, it, it's great. It's, it's, it's heroes like him uh, and yourself and the others that were with you that, you know, is a reason that people do what they do. You know, and it's it, inspirational that he continues, uh, you know, all of the all the stuff that he's doing. Yeah, I mean, like he served in the Army for 30 years. <laughs> he doesn't even hardly talk or want to talk about no. it. And, yeah, we barely scratched the surface, but... I figure it's better to scratch the surface than not to get on the surface at all. Yeah, you know, it, and I know it's got to be hard, even still to this day, for him to talk about um, with George. And it oh, yeah. was interesting to get the confirmation. So yeah. if you haven't listened to Sogcast <laughs> 01, yeah. if you haven't listened to that one, listen to that one, and then listen to this one, and you'll see that they tie together. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely, I know that's got to be difficult losing you know, the team that you were actually on oh, and yeah. not, not even gone from yet, but on. And, uh, and they went out and then you never saw them again. So I think it's, you know, that's a hard part. It's, it's discussing that. So it was good that he, he gave some insight into it and his experiences with it. Obviously, we heard from the troll, Mr. George Sternberg, uh, and what his actions were like on the ground. So it's, it's interesting to, to see that. Well, yeah, and how many... People, I think we can count them on about one hand. How many people actually ran recon with a team, lost a team, or like with Jim Short and Jones? Yeah. Who we had saw cast number two, two or three? Two. Two. And uh, he had that bright light <laughs> where he uh, wasn't able to get to the, uh, to the Air Force F4. And yes. years later, he went back on his own dime, got yep. chased off. Then he went in with DPAA, helped them. Yeah. And then, of course, DPAA, being the uh, scumbags they are, screwed him, yep. went back one more time, never took him, never had the courtesy to call. Yeah. But Spider is one of the few that's been back. Yeah. More than once, physically on the LZ, where the team disappeared, or where the bright light was shot up. And where yeah. Is he going back again? I, I thought you had said he was trying to. I don't know with everything that's happening in the world. Yeah, I think there's always the uh, desire to go back, and with world events, <laughs> the uh, the virus, et cetera, yeah. and um, <clears throat> I know he had to cancel at least one trip because of the virus. Yeah. He had everything set up, tickets purchased, uh, hotel Man. rooms rented, and just the thought of the Ashaw Valley with hotels in it was just kind of <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Maybe the casino you should go there and gamble. Oh yeah, <laughs> you are, I mean you guys already gambled there yeah. in the Asia Valley, like, right? You gamble with your life. Now you can gamble with some money, something yeah. that's not as bad. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, the 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 parts of Sog history that he participated in. Yeah. Good God, and uh, well, anyways, any other closing thoughts from you observing one of our Sog legends? Uh, no, just again, it's such an honor uh, to be able to sit here and and do nothing <laughs> to to listen to this so uh and uh the only thing i have to say is to all the families that are out there right now indeed 
Um, obviously, this will post later, but, you know, there's people still fighting for you. So always. keep that going, you know, keep hope. That's all you could say. And, you know, there's always people trying to help. And, and you know, keep that hope that they're going to help you. Indeed. Well, thank you, sir, and thank you for helping today. And uh, with that, one more time, we want to thank Jocko Echo Charles and his team for productions for doing our sawcast. Without them, we couldn't do it. And like you said, um, this particular moment in time, September 2nd, 2021, it's a unique moment in our country's history. And any of the families that hear this, you will remain in our prayers, the 13 families that paid the supreme price, that became gold star families, you will remain in our thoughts and prayers. You will not be forgotten. As we move forward, we thank those who are putting their lives on the line every day for our country. And uh, last but not least, um, with September, the third Friday of September is the National POW MIA Recognition Day, where from the Vietnam War, We've had that recognition day that's been a part of our history, often not given much attention, but the League of POW MIA families always does so. And if you're ever looking for donations to help, they still are there. They work with our government. They pressure the government. They work with the communists in an effort to help to return, locate, find, and return to our country. The 1,583 of uh, people, service members that are missing in action from the Vietnam War, which includes Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, North Vietnam, Thailand, and China. There's a few there. And with that thought, we want to salute those who did not come home and hope we continue to bring more remains back. Thank you to Jocko and his team. God bless America. <laughs>